Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining me. And before I give you the list of people appearing on the show, let me remind you what Warren Buffett taught us. He made the point that when other people are fearful, it's time to be greedy. And it might be worthwhile thinking about this as the stock market sells off today. Clearly the Dow Jones, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ Composite Index really had bad days at the office. Uh, S&P 500 down 4%, NASDAQ even more. But they were up for a couple of maybe two or three days beforehand, probably to the magnitude of what they fell off today. We don't really know what are the main drivers of the fear right now we're seeing on Wall Street. And Wall Street is the big driver of what's going on right now. Inflation is the concern. Target and Walmart have reported badly. And behind it has been higher prices for the stuff that they buy. Not so much a lack of demand, but certainly um, a rise in the costs of the stuff that they produce. Probably they've kept their prices competitive, which of course has shrunk their profit and justifies their stock prices should fall. And, you know, target share price fell 27% last night. So there's a fair bit of fear in there. But markets do have a habit of overreacting. It's going to be very interesting to see the course of inflation over the next two months. And I think it probably will take two months to get this negativity either out of our system or to see it get even worse. My suspicion is that inflation will dissipate over time. And when that happens, the fears around interest rates will be reduced and the stock market will start buying and buying up big time. I'm kind of thinking September, October is probably going to be the time when that will be proved to be right. Until then, I think we're going to have these kinds of volatility experiences that we're seeing now. And um, we will be watching the data very, very closely, the economic data very closely, to see if inflation is either on the way up or on the way down. The interesting point is the Australian stock market is doing a lot better than the US. Uh, before this 4% sell-off overnight, the S&P 500 was down 14%. It's now down 18%. Our market was only down 5.2% or something like that. So you can see our market is in a much better position for all those headwinds that are out there at the, right, at the moment. And uh, I think going forward, we've got a very good chance of maintaining this kind of stock market competitive advantage, but uh, we'll have to wait and see what comes. Let's have a look at the guests for tonight. I've got Marcus Bogdan, who's the uh, portfolio manager of the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund, but is also the founder of Blackmore Capital. Uh, he's, a, he's an expert on the funds that pay really good dividends. And lately he's dropped some stocks from uh, his fund and he's added some as well. We'll talk about that. Diana Mussina, uh, she is from AMP. She's a senior economist there, a really good economist. She looks at all the things out there right now, particularly what's going to happen to interest rates and whether there's going to be a recession or not. She's got, got a pretty good handle on what's going on there. Then we're looking at um, a company called EM Vision. Now, EM Vision has paid to be at our small cap conferences in the past. Um, it's an interesting company. I just wanted to check out to see what's been going on the company with the company. So I've got the CEO of that company, Ron Weinberger, and we talk about what's happening with EM Vision, which is in this sort of medical device space, a very interesting product. Then Chris Gray, uh, who's an expert on buying property and making money out of buying property. And Chris talks about whether you should worry when uh, the market gets so spooked. Uh, is it time to stop participating or is it time to participate? I'll go back to what Warren Buffett said. Sometimes it pays to be greedy when others are fearful. Chris Gray pretty well argues the same point as well. That's the show. Let's kick off now with Marcus Bogdan of Blackmore Capital. Joining us now is Marcus Bogdan of Blackmore Capital, who manages the the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund. I'm keen to hear what he's thinking about the, the sell-off we've seen uh, today on the market. Marcus, good to see you. Good morning, Peter, and good to be here. Hey, mate, uh, the market's just opened up uh, while well, I'm talking to you, and we've seen what's gone on in the US. My, my, my reaction this morning was, it looks like a bit of an overreaction 
Okay, Walmart's had an ordinary report and the Home Depot had a good report. Now Target comes out with a, a bad report. And sure, I think it tells us that in the March quarter, inflation was bad in the US, but we don't know what it's going to be like in this quarter and going forward. What's your feeling? Do you think this is a, a, a sign that there's another, going to be another big leg down for US stocks? Well, I think it highlights just the nervousness uh, that the market has got at the moment uh, in term, and that's been exhibited by the, vol the volatility, the nervousness around uh, the extent of, of how much the Federal Reserve and central banks will have to push interest rates up higher uh, to stem uh, this persistent inflation and whether that will be effective or not. And I think the second secondary issue is just on the trajectory of earnings, uh, both in the US and in Australia. You know, our universe is Australia, uh, and the earnings trajectory in Australia uh, and the underlying economy is still very sound. Uh, we have had a significant derating in the valuation of both the US market and the Australian market. Australia's valuation uh, price earnings ratio has fallen from a peak of just over 18 times to today to around 14 times, which is the th around the 30 year average. So I think a lot of it is now starting to be priced into the, into the market. But I do see that, you know, we could be still skewed towards further downside risk, but I do now start to see, as long as the economy remains sound, that, uh, that there's a, you know, a level of attractiveness coming in into some of these valuations. The interesting thing is, okay, Target and Walmart and other uh, c consumer staple and discretionary businesses have had inflation imposed upon them because of uh, oil price rises that have been rel related to the Ukraine war. And we also know that China's lockdown hasn't helped them as well. So in three months time, for example, if the um, China is our lockdown, one part of that inflationary pressure will be you know, coming down. And hopefully the Ukraine war might be over inside at least six months. And that's another one, which means it's, it's not unreasonable to believe that the inflation that was serious in the March quarter becomes increasingly less serious over the course of this year. You think that's an unreasonable expectation? Without me, me saying it's going to be accurate, but it's not unreasonable, is it, surely? I think what, I mean, what, what is being reflected now is just the reality on the ground. I mean, that there are higher costs uh, and then companies are trying to pass that through uh, to the end consumer. And what you are seeing with, with Target in the US and, and, uh, and Walmart uh, is that you know, they are trying to protect the, the consumer to some, to some point. Uh, in terms of in the inflation outlook, I think there is a level of persistence and I think it would be very ambitious that by the end of the year, that they would get back to their target range of around 2%. I think that is, that is too low. And I think you are seeing the persistence of higher energy prices. The concern there are just around, around supply. And I think a longer tail issue, uh, what we're seeing now uh, is the persistence of higher food inflation. Uh, and that could be offset uh, more broadly by, um, you know, a reduction in spending by consumers. But I do think the, the risk is that we, we continue to see high, high inflation, maybe not at the levels that we're, we're seeing today. Uh, and so that is really important in terms of how we positioning the portfolio in terms of the types of companies that we want to own in this type of environment. Let's, let's hope that I'm more right than you. Yeah. Only, only because yeah. I was, not because I want to be right. I want yeah. the stock market to go up higher. But yeah. you know, I think you know, what you, the, the argument you put forward has a lot of merit. My, my argument rests on uh, no more you know, lockdowns disappearing in China and the Ukraine mm. war ending. And, and they may, may well be very big calls. It might yeah. take a lot longer. Yeah. Um, let's go, go to some of you. And I hope you're right as well, Peter, rather than, <laughs> than, than, than <laughs> my. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, let's go to some of your 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 changes to the portfolio. I've got here that you know um, you've reduced your exposure to Helios and you've added Atlas Arteria ALX. Tell us why. Um, so Helios uh, was a terrific stock that we held through the pandemic. It was one of the few healthcare stocks because they're a pathology company that benefited from PCR testing. Uh, and so throughout the pandemic, you saw um, you know, over 100% uplift in profits in that, in that period of time. You know, we think that, that those levels of ele elevated testings will diminish over time. And so that the company is reaching sort of peak earnings. So we're taking advantage of the higher price uh, that we've enjoyed. Uh, and we're allocating capital to Atlas Arteria, which is a toll road operator in both Europe and, and, the, and the US. Uh, and it provides a very attractive dividend yield for our investors. And obviously it's an income fund. Uh, we want to, to, to make sure that we have really attractive levels of, of, of dividend levels for our investors. And so by taking some profits out of Helios and putting it into Atlas, we're actually increasing the overall dividend yield of the portfolio. Okay, now a company that I really like, uh, you have a, a, a view on Goodman Group, which uh, provide a, a, a recent trading update. So what's the story there with Goodman? Yeah, we like Goodman. They recently presented at the Macquarie Conference. Uh, and, and like uh, uh, the broad spectrum of property stocks that are, that are listed, there's been a significant sell-off, um, a sell-off of, you know, between 20 and 25%. Uh, and now we're starting to see some value, particularly in Goodman, because of the, of the ongoing outlook and the demand there for logistics uh, and distribution centers globally. And that's been reflected in an upgrade in their earnings. Uh, they were previously, well, at the beginning of this financial year, they thought that earnings were going to, or they forecast earnings were going to grow to 10%. Uh, they upgraded that to 20%. And then earlier this week, they've increased that again to earnings per share growth of 23%. And that is an, an outstanding result. Uh, and it yeah. also just reflects uh, the strength in that, that the underlying franchise of Goodman. Yeah, and, and, and Goodman uh, has a whole lot of industrial parks, but, and you know, it, it, anyone who hasn't seen a Goodman name outside an industrial park, obviously never goes for a drive, but they had been advantaged by um, the coronaviruses ability in the lockdown, the ability to make people buy online who would never have bought online before. And I remember interviewing um, um, that famous Melbourne um, demographer, um, uh, Bernard Salt, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Yes. And, and Bernard confessed he'd never bought anything online in his life, but now he was because he was locked down because everyone remembers the length of the Melbourne lockdown. In a sense, a company like Goodman has been helped by the fact that there are a lot more people buying online and the warehouses and the logistics services that go with that, they, they're, they're a beneficiary. Mm, certainly. And uh, look, the whole thing with the pandemic is that it's accelerated all of, the, all of these trends in terms of online. And whilst we're starting to see a recovery in, in sales and physical stores, uh, there has been a persistence there still on, on online. And I think it is important that, you know, um, Goodman is well positioned uh, uh, in terms of each of the jurisdictions that, that, that they operate in. Uh, and they have significantly important customers such as Amazon. Okay. You've also made points around the M&A activities out there, including Ramsey, RHC, and BXB's talk with CVC. Why don't you just talk through those, two? Sure. Um, so Ram, both Ramsey and Brambles have been long-term um, uh, share, share, um, shareholdings in the port portfolio. Uh, I think Ramsey's bid is far more developed uh, in, in terms of their engagement with Ramsey, their ability to get into the data room, and, and also uh, the... Um, uh, the consortium, including Australia's largest healthcare fund, HESTA, as, as well. And so I think 
uh, we're getting to, to see that, you know, they've been in the data room for, for several weeks now, and I expect to see uh, a, con a conclusion of that in, in the next little, little while. But um, certainly positive uh, in terms of those assets, in terms of, you know, owning hospitals. Uh, and then the second one has been Brambles, which has been, it has struggled in terms of its share price performance despite the underlying business being very strong and profits well up through the pandemic, both in terms of sales and, and, and earnings. All right, so what's the likelihood of both those um, um, acquisitions actually happening? What's your best guess? Well, I think um, for Ramsey, I think there's a, a much higher probability that a bid will um, be formalised there. Uh, they have um, initiated a, a cash bid of $88 a share. Uh, and I think that there is a very strong possibility that that will, con uh, that will continue to go, to go through. It does require, uh, you know, foreign dir direct uh, investment approval. And I think having Hester there uh, in the consortium is important. Uh, and, uh, and for Brambles, it is just far too, too early. And, and so um, I think there's a long way to go before uh, that could actually uh, get up at this point in time. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Cheers. Marcus Bogdan of the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund and the founder of Blackmore Capital. Well, a lot of people are worried about where the economy is going. There's talk about recession. There's fears around rising interest rates, you know, the, the pace of the rises and the amount of rises. So to get the, the latest view um, about what uh, Deanna Messina can see in her economic crystal ball, she joins me right now. Thanks, Deanna. Thanks for having me, Peter. Pleasure. So let's go through the... The, the, the fears that people might have. Um, what, what's the AMP call on interest rate rises to the end of the calendar year and then for the next 12 months? I think the next 12 months we'll see the RBA have a pretty aggressive rate hike cycle, the most aggressive that we've seen for, you know, obviously for more than 10 years because the last rate rise that we had was 10 years ago. We expect that the cash rate will end this year probably at about 2%. That's a pretty big rise given that just last month we had a cash rate that was 0.1%. And then by the middle of next year, we think the cash rate will get to 2.5%. So it is quite a significant lift in interest rates, which consumers need to be prepared for. But it does look like the RBA wants to get it on top of the high inflation readings that we've had lately. And that's really the key reason for why they want to be raising interest rates in the short term. Okay. Both you and I know it's really hard to work out what's going to happen to inflation. But mm -hmm. what is your, your current um, position on what you think is going to happen to inflation? quarter by quarter. So um, the June quarter, I would have thought would be slightly um, positively affected by the 22 cents a litre chop in the, the fuel levy. But then again, we have seen oil prices rise. And then let's go into the September quarter, if you can uh, give us yeah. those sorts of yeah. guesses, best guesses, or forecasts, we should call them. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think the quarterly inflation data has probably peaked for Australia, but that doesn't mean that annual inflation uh, has reached a peak yet. So we obviously had a big rise in the March quarter because of the huge increase in commodity prices across the board. So you're right, June quarter inflation data will be a bit lower, but still quite elevated. So headline numbers rising at about one and a half percent or so. And in the September quarter, probably a little bit below that, but still over 1% because we are still seeing broad based increases in prices across goods and services. Over a 12 month period though, we think that goods price inflation will start to come down. And the pace of increases that we've had in commodity prices is unlikely to be sustained at its current rate. So the annual growth in inflation will probably peak in the September quarter or so this year. And it will peak, we think at a level at around 6% per annum. 
So 6% per annum. If for reasons maybe explained by China coming back faster than we think and maybe the Ukraine war is over, mm -hmm. would you think that 6% number would come back a bit because of those two factors? There's lots of things going on here. Uh, yes, we think that in 12 months' time, annual inflation will probably be closer to about 3%, actually, uh, because a lot of the factors that we've seen lift prices, like the huge increase in, com in commodity prices, which started before the war in Ukraine. I think that that's really important to keep in mind, that we were already seeing a big lift in agricultural prices, in metal prices, in oil prices as well, and the war has exacerbated some of these impacts. We think that those prices for commodities will start to come off a little bit, and some of the supply chain problems that we've had due to the pandemic disruptions will start to ease off as well. And that should decrease some prices for goods. We've also had a big increase in goods production and manufacturing over the past few years because the huge increase in demand from, from consumers. But of course, as interest rates are going up, that demand will no longer be as strong as it was. So that demand should fall and, and goods prices should start to come down as well. Do you guys worry that even your own calls on interest rates could precipitate a recession because of the magnitude of people's borrowing over the last three years? It's a risk. I think recession is obviously, or not even maybe a recession, but you know, a, a big slowdown is, is a, a big risk, I think, for 2023. Uh, on the calculations that we've done, though, we think that a 2% cash rate is quite sustainable for consumers at this current point in time. I know that the consumers who have borrowed in the last two to three years will face a big increase in interest payments uh, because they fixed at a much lower rate. But if you look at the whole uh, the whole household picture, not just those who have borrowed in the last few years, uh, looking at those numbers, a 2% cash rate should be still serviceable for households given current income dynamics, given the huge buildup in savings that consumers have had. A 2.5% cash rate, though, I think we will see a pretty decent slowdown in consumer spending uh, and falls in home prices as well. And that is in our forecasts for, for next year. So obviously the RBA has to trade carefully here. I, I would like to point out though that the market pricing for the RBA is much more aggressive than even our view or the median economist view. The market has a cash rate of 3% by the beginning of next year, which is a lot higher than what we currently have priced in. I think a 3% cash rate would lead to a huge downturn in Australia for now. You, given your economics training, your experience working for organisations like CBA and now AMP, do you sometimes think that the people uh, in the bond market maybe have an excessive exposure to, to uh, mind altering drugs at times? <laughs> I don't know if I can uh, comment on that. No, you couldn't uh, say that. But do you think they're wrong sometimes? <laughs> the market's not always right, but I think it's the direction or the changes in market pricing that uh, I usually take the signals on. So the market has been priced in an increase, a significant increase in the cash rate for much longer than when economists were pricing that in. And the market has been correct in saying that central banks will need to raise rates much more aggressively than what everyone's anticipating. So maybe the cash rate won't get to 3%, but the market has been correct in predicting the earlier than expected RBA rate rises and more aggressive rate rises than what the majority of people or commentators were considering six months ago or even two months ago. Your colleague, Shane Oliver, is, is not negative on stocks for later in the year. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got volatility now, which is some, some nice signs that to me it looks a bit like the market's trying to bottom. Um, um, uh, do, do you suspect that once we, do you think some of the sell-off at the moment still emanating out of the US particularly, because that's where it's really been um, big sell-off compared to Australia. Do you think that the Americans may well start to pull back on the magnitude and the number of interest rate rises because, you know, maybe inflation is already peaking over there? Well, I 
think that that's the classic uh, thing that people in the markets call the Fed put, uh, that the Federal Reserve in the US doesn't want the share market to fall too much and that they will tailor back interest rate rises or rate hikes uh, to, to accommodate moves in the market. I do think that the market has probably become a bit too concerned by high inflation and rate rises. And, and as you said, as some of those rate rise expectations pull back, then we will see a recovery in shares. There are still a lot of negatives out there at the moment, though. This uncertainty as to how persistent inflation will be, I don't think anyone really knows the answer. You know, we can debate whether parts of it are transitory or more persistent, how long the increase in commodity prices will go on for. But at the end of the day, no one really knows. And that's what's causing the market to be so uh, chaotic and frenzied in terms of big falls in shares one day and then a recovery the, the next day. I don't see a full recovery in shares until we work through some of these issues and until we start to see the Fed hike rates a few times and then pause back. And that should see a recovery in share markets because the fundamental economic picture for the US economy is still quite strong. Consumers are in a great position. The labor market's extremely strong. Nominal GDP growth is high. There's still a lot of positives out there. I think the market is just getting carried away with expectations of very high inflation. Yeah, that's a really important point is that at the moment, expectations is dominating over some of the evidence like company reporting was pretty good mm -hmm. um, and uh, unemployment's terrific. Um, and, I, and, and the point was made by Jim Paulson, who is a, a US economist. He was making the point that like here in Australia, that personal balance sheets in America are really strong as well. And, and that could be a bit of a, uh, a buffer for all the fears around inflation potentially causing uh, a recession like or a big slowdown. Consumer balance sheets in developed markets are extremely strong because uh, thanks to all the government fiscal payments that were done over the last two and a half years, in the US, consumer savings are worth more than 10% of GDP. That's accumulated savings, additional savings that have been done over the past two and a half years because of uh, transfers from the government or because of cutting back on spending on services because we haven't been able to through the pandemic. In Australia, we've got a similar situation here. And that pent up level of accumulated savings should help to uh, assist consumers at a time when inflation is high. I suppose the problem though is inflation is occurring in those areas, those essential types of goods that you don't wanna be spending more money on, things like petrol, rent, uh, food, and consumers tend to feel that more. And, and that's why the consumer sentiment surveys across the US, Australia, Europe look so bad. But in saying that as well, last night's retail spending data for the US for April was pretty good. So I don't think that we're yet to see a big downturn in consumer spending because of all these positive tailwinds that consumers have had in the last two and a half years. Um, I, I, I'm interviewing you before the wage data. Uh, if the wage data comes out better than expected, would that help hose down expectations of, of a rapid rise in the cash rate? See, I think you're, you and the other people out there are right that the cash rate has to get to those sorts of levels, two and a half, three percent. But the critical thing is how long it takes to get there. And that will be determined by the pace of inflation, won't it? So yeah. if the wage data comes in as expected, that could hose down interest rate rise expectations in a short space of time. Uh, by better than expected, you mean not not, lower. Extremely, lower, not I think lower. extremely yeah. high. Yeah. I, 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 being a I stock interested person, I want wage data to, be, to rise at a decent rate for Australians to be be okay. But I don't want it to be excessive. So yeah. Australian it, employees it, might, want, might like it to be excessive. It, it doesn't look like wage wage growth is yet to get completely uh, carried away or very high. There still seems to be some inertia, which is what the RBA calls it in wage settings. So awards that have been set for a few years to rise at you know, about a 2% pace, which is where inflation has been over the past few years. Enterprise bargaining agreements have been set at a certain rates, public sector agreements. Now, even though the labor market is tight because the unemployment rate has fallen so much since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a little bit of flow through to wages, but you know, for today's number, we expect wages growth to be running about two and a half percent per annum. That's still pretty low 
you know, if wages growth was running at three or three and a half percent, you might see some more concern that we're going to get you know, carried away with very high wages growth. But it doesn't look like it will get there that quickly because of some of these other factors holding back the wages story. So I, I don't think that we are going to see a huge, fast increase in wages growth. I think it will be more of a slow burn, which may water down some market expectations for the RBA in the short term. Last question, and this is going to be a really easy one, um, Diana. So by, by good fortune, you end up with $100,000 given to you. And now you, you want to pay it off your mortgage because you're a rational economist. But would you, would you be afraid to put 100000 into an ETF for the ASX 200 over the next year or two? Well, Peter, I would actually put it into my mortgage because I have a huge mortgage. I know um, you we, say that. I um, you say we, that. Bought, we bought, uh, luckily, right before the, uh, right in the middle of the, um, of the pandemic, sorry. So we did okay. ride the big, uh, the, the big upturn in prices, but it's still extremely large and the rise in interest rates definitely worry me. But if I didn't put it in there, then uh, I would probably put it into an Australian ETF because I think that Australian shares at the moment have probably better prospects for growth in the short term. I see a lot of headwinds for US shares just because of the high exposure to tech and the consumer discretionary stocks, which I don't think will do as well as they have been over the past years because they've already had such a huge run up. Interest rates are rising. Bond yields are going to increase further a little bit, I think. That should probably won't be that positive for tech and consumer stocks. But I think Australian shares can do quite well. We've underperformed the US in the last few years, have a big exposure to commodity prices. Uh, which I think will still have another six months of a pretty good return. So I, I would I would put it into an Australian ETF. Great answer, Diana. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's Diana Messina from AMP. Well, joining me now is Ron Weinberg, who's the CEO and MD of a company called EM Vision. Aussie company trying to do something really big in the Big Apple and beyond America with a, a very interesting, I'm calling it a medical product, but it's probably because I'm an amateur. I'm, I'm sure Ron will correct me, mate. Great to see you. I'll need to see you, Peter. Is it a medical product? Yeah, it's a, it's a medical product, a medical device. Um, and uh, what we're really targeting at the moment is, is stroke. Stroke is the first indication for our technology, mm. which uses microwave radiation and imaging processes. So um, we all have been involved with people who've had stroke. Stroke is a huge health economic burden, hundreds of billions of dollars a year globally. Uh, 15 million people a year actually get stroke. Mm. Over 6 million people of them actually die, and many others have long-term rehabilitation and uh, morbidity issues to deal with as well as impact to the community. Yeah. So one of the reasons that that is the case is because it's hard to get good clinical diagnosis and treatment to these patients quickly as possible at the point of care. Mm. What we're doing is to solve that problem. What we're doing is developing a technology and a device that is able to be brought to the patient by the bedside or potentially to the patient in the driveway if they have a stroke at home uh, and to be able to diagnose the stroke, uh, to be able to classify the stroke into the two different types of stroke, which is very important for treatment, yeah. and then allow early clinical intervention. So mm. that's what we're about, changing the paradigm for stroke management. Okay, so in, in a perfect world then, this device of yours, which effectively gets inside the head to see how bad the stroke is, right? Yeah, that's right. So are you hoping that this would be in every ambulance for starters? So yeah. when cause you said the driveway, I, yeah. I presume that's an ambo. Do you want it to be in every GP's office as well or every ER room as they call sure. it? So we've got two versions. We've got what we call the Gen 1 version, which is for in-hospital use, yeah. and the Gen 2 version. And I'll just talk about because you pointed to the uh, ambulance version, the Gen mm. 2. Uh, we're working with the Australian Stroke Alliance, which is a large consortium of medical practitioners. Uh, and we've been very lucky to be part of their MRFF fund, where we receive $8 million in non-dilutive funding from 
the government via the Australian Stroke Alliance. Mm. Um, and we are working to develop an ambulance or a first responder device that is able to be used in the driveway to be able to diagnose stroke and to mm. improve patient care. Mm. So ideally what we see, what we're trying to do is move away from what today is mobile stroke units which are very large, huge trucks with CTs to something that you can put in the back of every ambulance mm. and completely change the way that, that um, paramedics and first responders are able to respond to stroke mm. patients. How about in the hospital, that's your Gen 1 yes. version, um, how big is it and why, why do you need something like that in the hospital when I presume there's MRI scan opportunities sure. in the hospital? Sure. So, um, well, there are a couple places where our device can actually be used. So firstly, one of those is in rural hospitals. Yeah. Uh, we know that one third of the Australian population is in rural areas and the further out you go two hours outside of a uh, local, urban and regional area, the access to CT and MRI dramatically decreases. So there's almost an exponential decrease mm. the further that you, that you go yeah. uh, away from urban areas. And those are very under, underserved and uh, patients have to go very far to be able to get good stroke treatment and diagnosis and maybe travel many hours. What mm. we're hoping to do is to put one of our low cost portable devices into those hospitals in order to be able to improve stroke triage and management at the point of care in those facilities. Mm. So that's going to really very much, and that's very much what the focus of the Australian Stroke Alliance is as well. Yeah. Um, in larger urban and uh, what we call comprehensive stroke units and stroke wards, what we're trying to do is to be able to improve the monitoring of patients. One of the things that happens with patients when they come into a hospital is that they're there potentially for an extended period of time if they've had a severe stroke. And um, uh, what can happen is they can have a secondary stroke. And this can be from the drugs that they've been given or the treatment that they've undergone. And uh, often it's very hard to see in these patients ahead of schedule what is actually happening to them, even though they're reasonably close to a CT or MRI. Mm. But they're only scheduled for a certain intervals to go to CT or MRI, yeah. and it's very hard sometimes to be able to access CT and MRI. Mm. So having a device that's by the bed allows you to scan the patients in 30 second intervals mm. and be able to uh, rapidly diagnose if the patient has had a secondary stroke and be able to monitor the progress of the existing stroke that they have, mm. which is going to dramatically change the ability. So we're not looking to replace CT and MRI. We're looking to, say, improve the uh, access to CT and MRI with our device. Okay. Um, do you need to be given a ticket of approval from the FDA to do something like this? Yeah. So what we do need to do is get, as you said, the tick of approval from the FDA, the TGA, the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, or the European authorities. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is uh, taking, we've had one pilot clinical trial where we've had 50 patients and it's been successful. We were able to get 97% accuracy with our device mm. in terms so of So saving anybody's life <laughs> when you're doing that? No, no. But no, no one's no, so seriously no, threatened with a stroke. No, 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 no. So that we, we, luck, it was not, inter <laughs> not interventional. We're trying to, trying to keep it simple. We don't, <laughs> want to, don't want to take on too much risk yeah. too early. Okay. But, but it would have been great if we could have. We would yeah. have been in the papers. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. uh, but... Um, what, what we've been able to do with that is show proof of principle. And now what we're doing is expanding that clinical trial to a much larger clinical trial. Okay. Uh, and we're looking at multiple sites. We're looking at Royal Melbourne Hospital. We're looking at Liverpool Hospital and Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane. We've got the uh, internal review board and the ethics approvals and committees to deal with mm. uh, and the processes along, along the path to get us there. And that will be the principle and foundational clinical study for our FDA application. And, and I, I presume, like, doctors want you to succeed. They just want to make sure it's reliable yeah, yeah, and right. Yeah. Um, are you there yet or improving everybody that, A, you're going to be reliable and right, or is there a little bit further to go before everyone says, 
got to get this happening? Well, we've got a lot of enthusiasm from our first trial because yeah. it, it was so successful. Um, and so we're building on that momentum. But at the end of the day, the proof's in the final pudding, mm. which is that you have to do a 300 patient or two 300 patient clinical trial yep. to be able to show unambiguously that your device can do what it says on the box. Well, Ron, so I'm asking the question that any viewer watchers will be asking. Um, at the end of the day, are you guys going to make, make this or will you, or will you be you know, bought out by some huge international company that says, we'll take that? We've had intense interest from large um, manufacturing companies and, and companies we've been talking to the likes of Siemens and Philips and GE and Nihon Code. And what would they Canon. know about producing stuff for medical? Industry? That's right, what would they know? They they, know. They, they, they've got no idea and here we are coming to tell them how to do it. Yeah. Um, but um, they, they have a lot of enthusiasm for what it is that we're doing mm. uh, and uh, we're in constant contact with them um, which is very exciting yeah. uh, because it means that there is something in the marketplace that a hole that we can actually fill yeah. uh, and and that gives us a lot of confidence. All right. So how long do you reckon before Ron, Ron Weinberger and his family are celebrating the product on the market and people using it to save people from stroke? The, the, the reality is, is so far we've kept everything on target and yep. we've been very fortunate, but I think that goes to the heart of the quality of individuals that we have in the company. We've got people who've done medical devices before. Mm. Um, I've been able to hire some of my colleagues from Nanasonics uh, in my previous uh, uh, existence. Mm. Uh, and they've had multiple successes in, in developing medical devices to regulatory approvals okay. and all the way through. Okay, so it's an exciting story. Someone watching this would go on their, their laptop, go into Google, put it, put EM Vision in their chart, up comes the chart, and the, and the stock price has copped it. There's a lot of tech yeah. companies. How, how do you as a CEO, MD, cope with the, what you would probably call the stupidity of the stock market? Um, uh, look, I think what you have to do is is just roll with the punches. Mm. I think you you have to be extremely focused on your objectives and your goals, yeah. and the goals are commercial goals. Uh, you have to work hard with investors. You have to work hard with the market. Um, as a small company in particular, you have to keep going and banging on doors and talking to people. So you have to do that. Mm. But there's only so much that you can control. What you can control is the quality of product that you produce in your manufacturing facility. Mm. Uh, and that's what we're really focused on. And if we can get that right, then I think the, the, the sky's open to us. Yeah. I guess it's a, bit, it's a bit like a horse trainer preparing a horse for the Melbourne Cup. And the bookies think it hasn't got a chance. And you as a trainer know, yes, it does have a chance. <laughs> well, it's exactly like that. I think, <laughs> I think, I think that um, we, we, we know that it's going to be successful. Mm. And it's really, um, what is the actual timing associated with that and how are we going to bring all the elements together to make it okay. the best product and company we can. I guess one final question, uh, is there a rival out there that you're going neck and neck with to, to do something like this or are you quite unique? We are unique. Uh, one of the things that there are companies out there trying to do EM or electromagnetic uh, imaging, but they're at a very early stage. Mm. What we are seeing is people trying to make smaller CTs and MRIs. Mm. Um, and there, there is uh, a, a movement towards that. It's still very, very early stages, and even those are 600 kilograms. Mm. Um, so they're still large and bulky, and they need radiographers. Our device is going to be portable and used by nurses or clinical staff at the point of care. And is it less threatening because like MRIs and all that sort of radiography yeah. and that sort yeah. of stuff have, you know, there's a plus but there's a little bit of a negative. Is yeah. it less negative with yours? Absolutely because there's there's virtually no energy output. Mm. I mean and there's a fraction of the energy from a phone that goes okay. into the patient's head okay. when it's being measured. Mm. So you don't have the issues such as gamma radiation and you know ferromagnetic radiation mm. and those sorts of things to deal with. So um, you know we we are extremely safe as a technology. Okay, good luck with it, Matt. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Peter. Thank you.
Well, a lot of people think they have to time the property market to make money. But an expert uh, friend of mine, Chris Gray from yourempire.com.au, makes the point that timing isn't A, easy, and B, you can lose out when you're trying to do it. Chris Gray, great to see you, mate. Thanks for having me on, Peter. So to give us the proposition you're making before we look at some of the charts that illustrate your point. Look, it, it, no one can predict the future. No one's got that crystal ball. And if we look back at the last few years of the economists and the banks, when we hit COVID, the event that no one had ever heard of, they were talking about the market dropping 10, 20 or 30 percent. When um, we were starting to recover from COVID, they said um, oh, the market might move five or 10 percent. And then now we're kind of coming off the back end of um, another real estate boom. And they're saying, oh, yeah, the market could be down 10 or 20 percent. But they haven't been right. So in COVID, things only dropped 5 or 10%, and that was really a temporary drop. Within a year, it bounced back. In 2021, most of us know that most parts of the country went up 15, 20, 25% versus their 5 or 10. So when I see the headlines of, oh, it's going to collapse and um, we've kind of reached a peak and it's going to drop 10 or 20%, then I definitely take it with a pinch of salt. And also, that's an average market for Australia or for Sydney. But even in one suburb, say, take Bondi, which everyone knows, there's probably 15 different property markets there, depending whether you're luxury or cheap or you're on the main road, you've got parking, you're a house or a unit. So there's multiple markets. So I prefer to get my information from being out on the street and actually seeing what's happening. Yeah, and I, I guess a critically important thing is, you know, who are the buyers? You know, what kind of um, inclinations have they got? What, how's their income going? And, and I, I know there's been some suburbs that re, do really well when the stock market's booming and investment bankers are getting big bonuses. Exactly. Probably one of the, um, the best economists I ever spoke to was a guy called John Edwards from a, a company called Residex. He, he's mm. now retired. Yeah. And there was this whole debate all the time around the world about um, house price or wages not keeping up with house prices. So how can property keep keep rising? And it came out with the classic thing of, look, our parents used to live in big houses. Now we're in small units. There used to be one income earner, and now there's two. They used to have 10 or 20 percent interest rates. We've got kind of under five or 10. But he said the biggest economic factor of property growth is supply and demand. And so if you've got an area where there is no more supply, i.e. there's three story height limits, it's close to the city, there's already plenty of properties. And you've got a large amount of demand from young professionals with wealthy parents um, that are, want to live near the city prices grow. So it's not a debate on whether that's right or wrong, but that's the most consistent market. And so if you then get, as you said, like the bankers that suddenly get their bonuses, like the Mosmans and the Palm Beaches around Sydney, sure, that goes off like a rocket. But at the same time is when we have the GFC, then certainly that can be the biggest hit market. So if you're really, really clever, you can try and pick these various markets and pick the peaks and troughs. But I'm, I'm a lowly accountant. I'm, I'm very good at basic numbers. And I'm very much a, a, a passive investor. I want to sit on my property for 10, 20 or 30 years. And so if you stick to a few basics of those blue chip suburbs, medium price property, you don't have to time the market because it's just consistent. It doesn't drop 20%. It doesn't grow 20 or 30%. But you get that nice 5 to 10% over the long term. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking there was a, a big boom. You might remember the, the precise numbers. There was a big boom in the early 2000s. And then for a while, for quite for 10 years, Sydney's market went kind of sideways if you look at the total city prices. But I guess within that, that period of time, some suburbs were actually doing very well and some were doing really badly, which gave us this average of prices going nowhere. That's, that's exactly, and I know it very, very well because I was at Deloitte in 2000, 2002 at 31, and that's when I actually gave up work because I was earning 80 grand or 60 after tax at Deloitte being not a very good accountant, but I was earning $600,000 from my six properties rising 100 grand a year. And I continued to buy from that 2000 up to the GFC and I was still buying in the GFC and property prices in Coogee and Bondi, Eastern Suburbs, Lone North Shore in the West, they were still rising, but the average in Sydney was zero. And so that's why most people sat on the fence. I guess there must've been a period where some of your properties that you might have bought at a, at a former peak went sideways or even went down for a while. But I guess if you weren't interested in selling them, it didn't really matter. As long as you're getting your rent and it was tax effective, I guess it still worked for you. 
Exactly. So the main idea with property for, say, a high income owners, so we're not after necessarily the rental income, is that the rental income pays the majority of the mortgage. You might pay five, 10, 15 grand per property as the, the negative gearing, but it's really that half a million doubling to a million and a million to two where the real money is. And we all know property doesn't rise every single day of the week. So the idea is, is I try and look at my portfolio every January. I try and assess if, it's, assess if it's risen in value. If it has, I go back to the banks. I try and refinance and I pull the equity out. If it hasn't, then I just wait till next year. And then with that equity, if I think there's tough times ahead or GFC or rising interest rates, I try and keep that cash buffer as, or sorry, that equity is more of a cash buffer. If I'm in my younger years, I'll reinvest and I'll reinvest hard and gear it up and then buy more property. And then obviously in my older years now, I'm, I'm kind of in my early 50s now, then I'll have more buffer and then maybe take more for a lifestyle, obviously, which is, is non-deductible. But you balance those ratios depending on how you see the market and your financial position and obviously your risk profile as well. Yeah, Because of that you know, young and groovy hairstyle of yours, mate, I couldn't pick how, how old you are. Very deceptive, very deceptive. Now, you, you've seen me... I still feel like I'm in my 30s, but I'm actually turned 51 last yeah. month. You're lucky that 30-year-olds now use the, the skinhead effect, and so people are always guessing. Now, mate, let's just be, look at a couple of charts that you sent along to us. And the first one on screen is the 1982 to 2022. You've got, you got uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. What is that telling people when they're looking at that, that chart? And so look, that's 40 years of property prices. And again, they're average property prices. So, so you can be above or below those lines. But generally, as we can see, the general trend is up. And that's a good thing. And so if you're investing for decades and decades, if you get a few bumps and a few quiet periods, it doesn't really matter. Now, the skeptics or the people that think they're too clever will always say, oh, I wouldn't have invested here in, say, 2002 or in 2010 because it's gone down or recently in 2017. But the main thing is, is you're never going to be able to pick it. So as much as we've got all these people like SQM Research, called Logic RP Guard, all those kind of, and, and obviously clever people like you as well, Peter, predicting the market, mm. then none of us can do it super accurately. So it's like, why bother? Why, why day trade? when you can just buy effectively the index, but in property, it's just buy a few multiple blue chip properties and then just hang on and go down to the beach for a year, hang out, take life easy, and then wait and, until um, next year and then see if it's risen again. Mm. But the main thing is, is the next graph. And this really is, is everyone's got a reason for not investing. So if we look at 16, 17, and 17 was our last peak, a lot of people weren't buying there. And obviously that's why it's great. Um, because everyone thought, oh, the market's rising too quick, we shouldn't buy it, it's going to go and collapse. Then it did peak in 2017, 2018. If you remember, we had um, the credit crunch and we had the Royal Banking Commission. And so people's attitudes were, I don't want to buy now because the market's going to be cheaper tomorrow. And I'm going to be clever and I'm going to bottom the market. And so I'm not going to buy. And then for a lot of them, they did want to buy after a while, but they couldn't because we had the credit crunch. And so the bank's serviceability wouldn't allow them to, to go and spend. We then got into 2020 and the market was about to start a boom again in, in February, but in March we had COVID. So obviously with COVID 2020, 2020, no one wanted to invest either. Then we had 2021, the first half, the market was absolutely flying. People thought COVID hasn't really affected us. And so everyone got in the market. But even by about June or July, people were calling the market saying it's already risen 10 or 15 percent. It can't keep going like this. And so we should stop buying. And so not a lot of people bought in the second half. And now, obviously, we're talking of 2022. We've got elections. We've got interest rates dropping. Oh, sorry, rising and property market dropping. So in that six year period, there was only probably six months when all your friends and colleagues would say, yeah, good idea. This is confidence. We're all on the same page. And you might have made 50, 100 grand, maybe 150 grand if you're lucky. Whereas those investors that had just been in for that whole six years would have made about 300 grand in uh, Sydney and about 200 grand if they're in um, Brisbane or Melbourne. So really what we're trying to say here is if you're going to follow the herd and, and buy when everyone else is confident, you've got that six month window. Whereas if you're a contrarian and you're investing for decade after decade, you're going to get the whole of that six years. You're going to get every day from the first step of the ladder to the end of the ladder, and that's really where the money is. Yeah, and I guess if you, you, if you put, you're making a case which also applies to stocks, that it's, 
It's actually time in the market rather than timing the market. But I, but I also do say, Chris, and I, I guess you would agree with this, that if you can actually do both, that A, you are in the market for a long time, but you decide to buy a quality property when, everyone's, when the market's falling and no one wants to buy, like for example, when Bill Shorten was scaring the pants off the market before the last election, well, that was actually a good time to be a buyer, wasn't it? Because after that election result, the market took off again. 100%. So I bought half my portfolio in the GFC. We were telling clients to buy in COVID. A lot of them did. So they bought a million dollar property for a temporary drop of 900. Then it bounced back to a million and then went up 25%. So effectively, they made like 35% on their money overnight. Mm. We're telling clients to buy now, just like we have on Sky News for the last 10 or 15 years, is buy when no one else is buying. So if you can do that, yes, you can definitely get some extra money. But the hard thing is, is you'll be going against your friends, family and colleagues. And that's why being an investor or a contrarian investor can be a lonely life because you've got all these barbecue experts saying, oh, I wouldn't be doing that now, Chris. Um, but over the long term, obviously, uh, you, you become the winner and, and that's the way it is. But it's, it is hard to go against the market because every time you think, oh, this is a one off and we've got something different. Yeah. The bottom line also is if you are going to be a contrarian and you are going to take on the market, you just make sure you can always service your debt. Exactly. So I'm very much into building your buffer. So having a cash buffer in case you lose your job, in case interest rate rises, in case you get um, strata levies and things like that. Mm. So I quite often try and separate my property portfolio from the rest of my life. So if I had a million dollar property, I might try and have 10 or 20 grand in my offset account and multiples of that um, if I've got multiple properties. And so whether I've got a job or not, then that's completely separate. Mm. Um, every, everything else just looks after itself. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Chris Gray from Your Empire.